Hello, I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. We have a jam-packed schedule like usual. No we, difference. We do. You know, we brought back some of our heavy hitters and we got a really good program today. We got um, Dr. Jonathan Larson's going to be talking about some, um, some spring emergence, right? You know, maybe not leaves and flowers, but maybe some of the insects that might be coming out around this time of the year. So we're always glad to have Dr. Larson. He's a wonderful resource. Um, we also have our very own Megan Bulin, who's going to be talking about what's that fungus or is it? Um, so we'll, we'll learn a little bit more about that. Um, we've got our tree of the week and we have Darren Morris, who's with the White Oak Initiative and he's the coordinator of that program. And they have just released a White Oak conservation plan. So it's really exciting and progress in the White Oak Initiative. And we'll have Darren talking about that. So thank you all for being with us. If you join us via Zoom, you can use the chat function. And if you're on Facebook Live, please use the comment section and we'll respond accordingly. But yeah, really excited about today's show, Renee. Yes, definitely. So let's get started. So uh, Jonathan, if you want to go ahead and uh, pull your camera up. Thanks for joining us today and telling us a little bit about bugs that are emerging <laughs> on us. <laughs> well, hopefully not on to you directly. <laughs> oh, uh, not. Yeah, uh, we could talk a little bit about that, I suppose, talk about <laughs> some of the, the ticks and things that are starting oh, to come oh, out this yeah. year. But I assume most people want to hear about the happy bugs instead. <laughs> there we go. I thought I'd, I'd focus bugs. a little more on that. <laughs> right. uh, so I guess the, broadly what I wanted to mention is that when we're talking about insects, we're talking about things that when they, over, when they are trying to survive the year, uh, they have to try and figure out how to survive the winter. Insects, their whole life is really kind of dictated by the climate that surrounds them, in particular the temperatures that they're exposed to. And they really don't tolerate cold temperatures very well. Insects are what we call poikiliothermic, which is just sort of a fancy way of saying that they're the same temperature as the surroundings that they live in. It's very similar to what we talk about with you know, alligators and frogs and things like that. So whatever temperatures they're experiencing, most insects, their internal temperature will match up with that. And so that has consequences just in normal times of the year. They got to move out of the sun to cool down. Uh, they have to get into the sun in order to warm up. There are some exceptions. You could talk about honeybees and a few others, which can generate heat by vibrating their wings very quickly. But by and large, everything about their temperature is really dictated by their surroundings. And when it comes to winter, that can have consequences because if they get too cold, uh, they can ultimately end up perishing. And so insects have adapted to develop overwintering strategies throughout the year, uh, throughout the winter. Uh, all the different species that we experience uh, have a different overwintering strategy. We can group them together broadly into saying that some of them will avoid cold temperatures and then others are actually able to survive being frozen and then unthaw and then thaw themselves out and are able to come back and bounce back from that. If we look at some of uh, the different examples, there are some that will actually use their body fluids in order to control where they freeze or if they freeze, we call these insects freeze tolerant or freeze intolerant species. I think the most famous example of this is the woolly bear. Uh, the woolly bear is a very famous caterpillar. We have a festival dedicated to them here in the state of Kentucky is my understanding. Uh, they have that brown and orange kind of color pattern on their back that some folks believe uh, will help you to predict the winter. Unfortunately, their track record is worse than most meteorologists. So we don't rely on them uh, for that information. But they do produce an actual antifreeze in their blood. Uh, it's a glycol, just like what you pour into your car in the winter or uh, try to use as an antifreeze or coolant in the summer. Uh, these things, they produce that in their own body and it helps them to lower their freeze point. So they actually don't freeze at 32 degrees anymore. They, they can get much colder than that and still be alive and still be unfrozen. Others, they will actually sort of push water around in their body or they can dictate where ice crystals will ultimately form in their body. And they'll try to make those form in areas where there's fat cells and things like that, uh, which will help them to survive being frozen. It won't, it, it won't kill them because the important organs are the, aren't the ones that are getting zapped up by the cold. So uh, ultimately these ones, they use something inside of them or some sort of chemical to really impact where the ice crystals are or if they will form in their body at all. For others, they actually have to get away from the cold. They can't survive it in any fashion. They have to try and get away from it. Uh, these would be just like the snowbirds or 
uh, your grandparents that go down to the to Arizona or Florida in the winter trying to get away from colder Kentucky temperatures. And so they migrate away. Uh, these uh, are sometimes the most famous of our insects with uh, overwintering strategies. I would say the fa most famous example is the monarch. The monarch will come up north in the spring and summer over successive generations and they will mate and then kind of leap into multiple states as they go further north. And then in the fall, the ones in the furthest north range, they will migrate all the way back down into Mexico for the winter. Uh, there's a special habitat down there that they use to hide out from the cold. The temperatures are also much more agreeable to them. We also see this with painted lady butterflies. They come from California and they may go uh, east from there and kind of do the same successive generations across the country. And then they go and migrate back to those nice overwintering spots. So they literally just get the heck out of Dodge. They don't want to be around the cold at all. There are other species that have sort of migratory patterns like this. One famous one we experienced last summer was the fall armyworm. They don't over, they don't migrate in the way that we think of like with the monarch, but they do have the successive generations that go north the next year. Uh, the only difference here is that the fall armyworm, wherever they end up in the northern climes, like once they get up into Indiana and Illinois and even Iowa and Nebraska, once it starts to get cold there, they all just die. Uh, they, they don't make it back down south. They just freeze to death. It's a very strange thing, I think, that they haven't learned how to get back down to where the overwintering spots are. But they are able to survive in places like the southern tip of Texas and Florida. And then from those reservoirs come the next generations, the next year, that kind of move in this successive pattern through the southern states into places like Kentucky and Tennessee after that, and then into the Great Lakes and New England region. A lot of people dealt with this in their yards and places like that last year. We saw it in corn and alfalfa as well. Uh, we call it an annual migratory pest because of the, the way that they actually kind of successively come up into states like Kentucky. Then we have some that they stay local. They never leave. They just find a spot locally that they can use as sort of a warm hidey hole that gets them away from the cold air temperatures. And so they will avoid freezing by getting down into the soil. Uh, others may use leaf litter. Some may use a log or the inside of a tree. Others may actually sort of construct a harborage that they will ultimately use to keep themselves safe. So for soil, we would point to things like white grubs. White grubs, they move further down in the soil profile as October sets in. They get below that frost line, and then all of that soil is there to keep them safe from those cold air temperatures, and they never experience them. They stay a balmy 40 or 50 degrees. Others, it can be razor thin margins. You could be looking at these lady beetles in the middle inside of a leaf or these eggs of the bagworm on the far right. Uh, these insects, they may be sort of living and dying by one degree or, or less. If they can keep the inside of that bag at uh, negative 13 degrees and the air temperature is negative 14, they will survive. The same is true for lady beetles. It's just this numbers game with insects. They have to play it very close. Uh, and ultimately, they'll still be able to survive. For all of our species, we have a lethal temperature and then a lethal amount of time. So they have to be exposed to, for example, uh, bed bugs. They'll die at negative 20 degrees, but they have to be exposed to that for five straight days before they'll actually perish. If they get above negative uh, 20 at any point in that time frame, they'll actually survive and the whole the clock starts over at that point. So it's just a very interesting phenomenon with all these different species. They have these razor thin margins that they're living and dying by. And it just means that we can't really rely on old man winter for a lot of pest control. Everybody's always very hopeful that a hard winter or a weird freeze will have done something to populations, but very rarely does that end up occurring, unfortunately. Uh, they do sometimes use our homes as the uh, overwintering site. Many of you may have been experiencing this over the last uh, couple of growing seasons and winters. We've been having an expansion of brown marmorated stink bug in the state and they love our houses to them. It's like this deluxe primo heated log that they can use as an overwintering site. If you have a home that is kind of lighter in color, if you haven't done anything to make sure that heat isn't leaking out of your house, if you haven't done weatherproofing or winterizing, uh, they can detect that heat a little bit better. They also just love homes with large south and western exposures, so they get heated up by the sun. And many of these species like brown marmorated stink bug, 
uh, the multicolored Asian lady beetle and a few others. They like tall houses. They like tall trees and nature. And so any house that's kind of taller than its surroundings, they're going to key in on and be like, wow, this is great. I kind of want to move in here. Uh, maybe I'll buy it, use it as an Airbnb. Uh, they're just very interested in using those kinds of structures because they provide a lot of protection. And then any of that pest, uh, any of that weatherproofing you haven't done can also lead to an ease of access for insects because weatherproofing ultimately becomes pest proofing. So we always encourage people to make sure that they're uh, checking screens, checking the strips around doors, fixing caulking in cases where it's getting holy or anything like that, just to make sure that pests can't get in. I will share that there's a few unique and beautiful insects that we can find as spring begins. I picked out the butterflies that I wanted to share today. If you get out there right now, you can actually find a few of these fluttering. Uh, they're getting active and kind of moving around. They overwinter the species I'm going to mention, most of them as adults. And then they come out when the snow starts melting and the temperatures start warming up. The most famous example of this is the morning cloak, which we see here. This is a very beautiful butterfly, I would argue. Has a unique coloration, that yellow margin with the blue dots. If their wings are closed and you're looking at them from the side, they do kind of resemble a dead leaf. But when the wings open up, you see that beautiful coloration on the inside. They're also quite large. They're about four inches wide. Uh, and they're very hungry when they first wake up. So you'll see them moseying around to early spring flowers, trying to visit it to get nectar. Uh, they are hungry and trying to, to energize themselves so they can get ready for the growing season. They're some of our longest lived butterflies. They live 11 to 12 months since they overwinter as adults. So the other thing that often happens is people find them crawling out of log piles or out of tree holes, and they're very beat up looking because they've been trying to survive for so long. The scales are coming off their wings. They don't look quite as pristine as the butterflies in the summers do. Uh, I also just think they have a beautiful name, frankly. Uh, the morning cloak name is supposed to be evocative of this dark coloration that transitions to the yellow. An entomologist who apparently was involved with the naming said that it reminds him of, a, I think he said, a cheeky young woman who doesn't want to be in mourning and so lets her yellow dress peek out from under her dark clothing. Uh, and he, he seemed to think that this was evocative of spring, kind of daring winter when it first comes out uh, in, in the early part of the year. So it uh, has an interesting name, kind of a, a, an important pop cultural insect as well, features in detective stories in England a lot, because it does actually migrate over to there from North America, from what I've read on its life history in, in some cases. So just an interesting looking one. If you have elms or willows or hackberries near you, or even wild rose, those are the preferred larval hosts, so they will uh, be populating that area and moving in to try and use those to lay their eggs. We also have what I call the punctuation mark butterflies. They come out very early in the growing season, so we have the question mark with the blue background there, and then the eastern comma. These can be seen fluttering in March and April, depending on how warm it gets, how quickly. They have these sort of scalloped edges to their wings, uh, they're both orange and brown in coloration when you look at them when the wings are open. When the wings are closed, uh, they look like a dead leaf. That scalloping gives them sort of a dead oak leaf appearance. And then it also shows how they get their names. Uh, so these were named by scientists who thought when you looked at these silver shapes on the outside of the wing that they look like certain punctuation marks. The one on the left is the question mark. Uh, it's sort of, I would, if we named this today, I would call that low Wi-Fi signal, pr uh, probably. I think it looks more like a dot with kind of that bow over the top. Uh, but in the past, they thought this looked like a broken question mark, and that's how it got its name. The one on the right, there's a silver comma. Uh, I have this image oriented uh, sideways a little bit, but you can see that comma, the kind of bow shape there. Uh, and these were named for these silver shapes that pop up on them. One of the interesting things about these is they overwinter as adults, and when they come out, there's not a lot of flowers for them to feed on. And so they've evolved over time to actually specialize as adults on feeding on dung and rotten fruit, and particularly tree sap. They'll also be seen sometimes on carrion. They'll feed on dead animals. They'll drink up juices from there. But they love tree sap. So we see them on sugar maples and things like that in the spring, where they'll be lapping up what they can get if it's kind of oozing out of the tree. And that's what you see in this image here. Uh, both of them as immatures, they feed on elms and hackberries, but they also like nettle a lot. So if you have nettle in the area, various species of nettle, 
uh, that will recruit the adults and they'll lay their eggs there and you may see them more frequently. Uh, question marks are kind of interesting. If you talk to hops growers, people who are helping to produce ingredients for beer, uh, the question mark butterfly is actually one of their top pests. For some reason, they love to come into hop yards and lay their eggs. Uh, there is some sort of chemical relationship there where they're attracted to it and they can come through and cause quite a bit of devastation. Uh, so another beautiful one, kind of an odd life history. And that brings us to the zebra swallowtail, another butterfly that's pretty unique. Uh, it's the only one of its kind that we see in the state. These are called tight-winged swallowtails because of how they hold their wings. We do find these occasionally in Kentucky, slightly rarer here than in some of our southern neighbor states, uh, but they do have an early spring brood. So they will uh, pupate in the winter. And then there's a, a brood of them that comes out very early in the spring, starting in March actually. And they come out, they start flying around. The way that we can tell some of the differences here between broods, the spring brood on the left here, they're smaller and their swallowtails are smaller, those tails that go off the tail in there, uh, and their stripes are thinner overall. The one on the right here is a summer brood member, and so it looks a little more robust. Uh, just sort of a, a biological factor of coming out early, you're probably not going to be as robust and healthy. And so they just look a little bit different. But what I really like about this species is that they specialize in using pawpaw as their larval host plant. I've heard about pawpaw. I'm from the woods today before. I think I've been on when somebody else was talking about pawpaw. Uh, I know that we love the Indiana banana or whatever you want to call it, and that some people are trying to plant it and kind of bring it back. But this is going to be an insect that you'll see on those plantings. Uh, it shouldn't be a devastating pest. It shouldn't cause enough issues to really warrant any treatment or anything like that but it is something that has a unique relationship with that plant. There have been some scientists that have looked for other hosts that they'll use. They'll apparently also use soursop, which is I think a more tropical tree, uh, but that, that's closely related to the, the pawpaw. So that's their preferred host plant. They wanna be on pawpaw. One of the other interesting things about them is if you ever find their eggs, it's kind of a single orange orb that's quite large on the bottom of a pawpaw leaf. It looks like those glass balls that some people put on like concrete pillars in their yard as decorative items, but small. And those are laid individually on the trunk and on the leaves, and they're separated from each other by quite a bit of distance. And that's because they're cannibalistic when they first emerge as caterpillars. They will eat their siblings if given the opportunity. Many of you may feel the same way about your siblings, I'm not sure, but uh, they do find it uh, opportunistic to go ahead and devour their brothers or sisters. And so females have adapted over time to put those eggs as far apart as possible. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention there were some pests that come out early in the spring, just sticking with our Lepidopteran theme here. I wanted to point out that one of our early riser caterpillar pests is the Eastern tent caterpillar. They overwinter as eggs. I'll show those eggs here in a moment. But they get started in the early spring. They've already begun hatching according to our growing degree day calendar. So there are small versions of this caterpillar that you see here already starting to build their webs and get going. You can see these in the woods. You can see these on private property. Uh, it, it's a very robust and healthy caterpillar population. They feed on hawthorns, maples, cherries, peaches, pears, plums, uh, all those different trees that we enjoy planting and having around us. In terms of identifying them, their nest is, uh, is distinct from other web building caterpillars. They build it down in the crooks and crotches of the branches. They tend to make it very compact. They'll expand it as they grow and need more food, uh, but they don't leave the nest too often. They feed three times a day. Uh, to do that, they leave the nest and slightly extend it and it'll get bigger, but it stays sort of localized to those crooks and crotches. Their overwintering stage as an egg is what gives them a leg up on some of their competition. If you ever go around and look at trees and you see, I, I think it looks like pyrite gum. It looks like fool's gold. It has that same sparkly splendor to it and it looks very putty-like or gum-like, and it's wrapped around tree branches. Uh, and you can scrape this off if you don't want to deal with them. You can leave it be if you'd like as well, live and let live. But it is uh, very distinct and very obvious if you're doing any sort of inspection of plants in the winter. And we try to get people to prune these out or scrape it off with a pocket knife. I also wanted to compare this to fall webworm just because these are often confused for one another. Fall webworm is a later season pest. They do get active as early as May. I think I received a sample of them in May last year, um, or e either that or early June. But they are pests of walnut, birch, and cherry, and crabapple. They tend to be active later. 
They are a different color as well. Instead of having that reddish hair, they have white hairs on their body and they build their nests over the tips of branches. They incorporate leaves into them. Uh, this is a video of me dissecting one of the nests uh, that I found a couple of years ago. It's very messy. It's all over the place. These can cover a quarter to a third of a tree. It's full of old dead leaves that they fed on, as well as old caterpillar skins and frass that they've left behind. So this isn't one that you're gonna see now. It'll be a couple of months, but just because they get confused with their cousins, the Eastern tent caterpillar, I did wanna bring them up. The reason they don't get active as early as the other one is that they overwinter as pupa in the soil. So the adults don't usually get started until about mid-June. Uh, it's just this interesting sort of temporal separation. Unfortunately, the pests can sometimes seem kind of crafty and they seem to divvy up the year and divvy up the plants so that they can bother us as frequently as possible. But I would be remiss if I didn't mention some pests as well as those beneficials. Well, thank you very much for that. You know, some of those butterflies, I don't think I've ever seen around here. So I'm glad to know that they are, they're around. <laughs> they are. If you go out in the woods right now, you could definitely find morning cloaks. I've seen a few of them uh, since I moved back to Kentucky. It's mm -hmm. one of my favorite butterflies. I say it, that's one of my favorite bugs about a lot of things. I was going to say, I hear yeah. that. <laughs> I think I hear a pattern here. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're all great in their own way. But the morning cloak, <laughs> just the fact that it gets started so early. They're also the state butterfly of Montana. I, I should mention that as well. Uh, and then the zebra swallowtail is the state butterfly of Tennessee. So uh, these spring species, they do have sort of cultural connotations for some communities. Uh, I just think that it's interesting to overwinter as an adult butterfly. It's not something that you think about finding that like beautiful sort of ephemeral looking insect in the middle of January if you're digging around inside of a tree. I think it would be startling to people. Uh, and then they see them flying around in the spring and they want to know what's up. We did have a comment that someone saw a tiger swallowtail about 10 minutes ago. <laughs> that's awesome. Congratulations. I think that's good luck or something. Uh, I think it's out in Letcher County there. But, um, you know, Jonathan, really appreciate you coming on. You, you really yeah. highlight so much of the natural world that I think a lot of people kind of gloss over, right? And, <laughs> um, I, uh, it's so important. And all of these insects play so many important roles. And, uh, yeah, so thank you really. For, yeah. You're really good at this. And we really enjoy <laughs> having you on the show. I, I thought of the you the other I thought of you the other day I was putting mulch down that I had left over and there's white things in it I was like oh is that termites <laughs> <laughs> I was like I need Hopefully to talk not. to Jonathan <laughs> yeah send me a picture that's what I'm here for I'm always happy to answer questions take phone calls take samples um, but hopefully we all get to go out and enjoy some of these these pretty spring ones before the pests really set in and cause problems yes no doubt thank but, you very much yeah, always enjoy having you thank you so much Jonathan all right, so Very moving cool. on to our next topic yeah. is our Tree of the Week. Tree of the Week. And Laurie couldn't be with us today, but she did prepare our Tree of the Week, and I'll, I'll get that to you. And it's really a smaller tree. It could be considered a shrub sometimes, um, but it's one you've probably seen around, and it's one that gets confused with some other plants. So um, hmm. pay attention to this Tree of the Week. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Forestry and Natural Resources Extension, and I'm here with the Tree of the Week, the Smooth Sumac. Rus glabra is a small tree or large deciduous shrub that is a member of the Anacardiaceae, or cashew family, and it is one of four sumac species found in the eastern United States. Poison ivy is also in this family. It can be confused with shining sumac, staghorn sumac, and tree of heaven. This thicket-forming tree or shrub typically grows between 10 to 20 feet tall. Smooth sumac usually has a short, multi-stem trunk with a sparse, widespreading crown of stout branches. While not an important timber tree, it is a valuable wildlife tree. Smooth sumac's range includes most of the eastern and midwestern United States, with scattered populations throughout the west. It is found in most counties in Kentucky. Smooth sumac grows in a wide variety of habitats from open woodlands, prairies, dry rocky hillsides to protected ravines and is also found along roadsides and in old fields. Best growth is in moderately deep soils that can be dry to moist with sunny exposures. It is a climax indicator in a number of shrub grassland systems and a prominent species in prairie and oak savanna communities. Smooth sumac is relatively shade intolerant. Smooth sumac is deciduous with large, alternately arranged compound leaves, as you can see in the photo. 
the leaves are 12 to 18 inches long and pinnately compound like a feather, then they have 11 to 31 lance-shaped leaflets. The leaflets are 2 to 4 inches long with serrated leaf margins. They are dark green above and pale below with fine hairs. Autumn color is showy, ranging from deep orange to deep scarlet. Smooth sumac is dioecious, which means there are male trees and female trees. It has small, greenish to pale yellow flowers that are in dense, upright, pyramid-shaped clusters. The clusters can be up to 8 inches long, and the flowers bloom in summer, and they are pollinated by insects. The fruit is an edible droop that contains one seed. The droops are in large, upright, pyramid-shaped clusters, and the droops are small, about an eighth inch around. They're round, red, and slightly hairy. The fruit ripens in fall and will remain on the tree throughout winter. Smooth sumac produces some seed nearly every year, and the fruit is eaten and the seeds are dispersed by a variety of birds and mammals. Smooth sumac also reproduces vegetatively by rhizomes that spread from the tree to form dense thickets of new trees as far away as 30 feet. The bark is brownish gray and usually smooth with many lenticels when young. As the tree ages, the bark develops scaly ridges. Smooth sumac is an important wildlife tree because the fruit persists through the winter months, which provides a ready source of food when other food for wildlife may be scarce. A variety of insects consume the flower nectar, such as mining and bumblebees, and mammals consume the fruit and leaves, such as deer and possum. The fruit are eaten by wild turkey, gray partridge, and mourning dove, and it is the larval host for the red-banded hair streak butterfly. The national champion smooth sumac as of 2021 is in Washington state. It's 26 inches in circumference, 35 feet tall, with a 29 foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about national champions, check out American Forest Champion Trees or check out the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about smooth sumac. Native Americans traditionally made hot and cold beverages, dyes, and medicines from the fruits. The young sprouts were eaten in salads, and the leaves were mixed with tobacco and other herbs for smoking. The leaves of this plant are a source of black ink. Pigment can also be obtained from the wood of this plant, and it's been used in the textile, toy, and paper industry. ID tips to distinguish from staghorn sumac. Staghorn sumac has velvety branches, buds, and leaf stalk, whereas smooth sumac branches and leaf stalks are smooth and without those velvety hairs. The scientific genus name Rus is from the Greek Rus, which is the common name of the sumac, and Glaber, the species name, is from Latin and means smooth without hair. I'm glad you joined me to learn about the sumac, and I hope you get the chance to get out into your woodland, a local park, or neighborhood, and enjoy the splendid sumac. Well, we thank Lori for uh, doing that for us, even though we know she couldn't join us. But, you, you know, Billy, is that something you'd want to plant in your yard? It could be. I mean, it looks know, pretty. Yeah. <laughs> you know, our answer always here is, well, it depends. I you know, know. It, that's why I was it, asking. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it could be, really. It's a beautiful specimen tree. Um, it will kind of take over in an area, so you might want to put it on the edge. Um, and it can be a little bit trashy with some of the debris in the fall as well. So, you know, in the right place, it's a beautiful, um, small little shrub, but it can kind of take over a little area. So I wouldn't put it like front and center in my yard um, necessarily. Got it. All right. All right. Well, moving on to what's that fungus, or I guess we changed the title to maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Megan, it's good for you to be here today. Hey, Megan, good. glad to have you. Tell us a little bit about what you're talking about. Sure. So today we're talking about something a little bit different. Uh, the title of this segment usually is what's that fungus? And at first glance, this organism might look a lot like a fungus. And taxonomically for a long time, we thought that these were fungi. But now we know that there's something a little bit different. They're called slime molds commonly. Uh, they're not true molds like fungi, but they're another class of organisms called myxomycetes that look and act a lot like the fungi that we consider to be molds. And that's why we call them as such. Wow. This is a cool slime mold that we saw a while back and thought it would be a really fun uh, organism to, to feature since there is a lot of overlap between the way that people look at slime molds and the way they look at fungi. Yeah. Right. Well. Um, 
I'm excited about this fungal controversy we got going on. So. All right, Billy, All right. let's have a look. All right, thank you, Megan. So this is a really, really cool find. When you first look at this, you might think that these are just some decaying yellow mushrooms, but that's not all that's happening here. These are some uh, decaying fungi, probably Pleurotus oyster mushrooms, that are actually being colonized by a slime mold, a myxomycota. Now from the name, you might think that slime molds are fungi because we've talked before about how molds are actually uh, all fungi. But slime molds aren't. Their common name kind of tricks you. They're actually an amoeba, an amoeba that lives in groups of single-celled organisms. And they move around feeding on decaying material, on bacteria, on fungi, on all kinds of other, other things that they help break down. So what we actually have here is this really fascinating uh, slime mold that's growing all over these decaying oyster mushrooms and spreading this beautiful yellow network uh, throughout the, the oysters and the moss that's growing around them also. Well, that was definitely unique, that's for sure. <laughs> so does it grow on other things as well? Oh, sure. Now you don't have to worry about this as a pathogen. It won't grow okay. on uh, like your living plants as something that might hurt the plants mm -hmm. and it won't infect animals. Uh, slime molds by and large are decay organisms. So they're feeding on things, dead matter that's breaking down in the environment. That's why the mushrooms in that video, those Pleurotus oyster mushrooms, they were in the process of decaying and the slime mold was just taking advantage of that opportunity for a nice yeah. meal. Wow. That's really cool. I, I did not yeah. know. Thank uh, you. I did not know that. I would have thought it was some kind of mushroom as well. <laughs> so <laughs> interesting. Oh yeah, they're they're really interesting fungi. And the one that's in the video, the, the Physarum species, is actually a really interesting model organism that's used in a lot of research uh, because of the ability for these fun these slime molds to kind of problem solve. They're a colonial mm -hmm. group of organisms, so a lot of small individuals that make up a colonial network and they'll solve patterns like the Tokyo subway system. These are videos you can look up on YouTube. They'll put a food reward somewhere on one end and place this slime mold in the center. And you can watch this slime mold solve the problem of this really intricate network system. Uh, they're very cool in the oh, way that wow. they Oh, oh, great. Now you've sent me down the YouTube path yeah. on I'm watching slime Smart mold slime. videos. <laughs> <laughs> Very interesting. Megan, I'm, again, you know, kind of like Jonathan, you know, you're showing us some stuff and kind of highlighting the things I think a lot of people kind of overlook and um, I, I appreciate it really. It's a, important um, what, what you're doing. So thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. I hope you have a great day. Me too. Excellent. Very cool. All right. So we've been looking at kind of small scale stuff, right? right. I guess, exactly. you know, I mean, not small in numbers, but small right. in stature, perhaps. And uh, we're switching gears to something that's really kind of big, big. Uh, really big. So today we have Darren Morris with us and Darren's going to be talking about the White Oak Conservation Plan. And, you know, Darren, you've been part of the White Oak Initiative for a few years now. And I know this is a kind of an important milestone for the group. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, really, it was three years in, in, in the process to get this thing uh, to its final stages and, and finally printed. So uh, yeah, it's a big deal. There's a lot of information in this. Uh, it's a 60 page document, um, but it, it's also geared for landowners and others who are just interested in what's going on with White Oak. You don't have to know a lot about it. Um, and there's also information in there for professional foresters and other managers as well. So it's, it's uh, restoring sustainability for White Oak and Upland Oak communities, uh, conservation plan for the White Oak Initiative. Um, it's not just about managing White Oak, it's about managing Upland Oak forests. Um, White Oak is considered a cornerstone species. So, you know, when, when management work happens to White Oak, good things happen to the up, Upland Oak forest as well. Um, so I'm gonna scroll through here and try not to make y'all dizzy. The table of contents, uh, of course, the introduction is basically uh, the first 10 pages. Um, it, it sort of gets you into what's going on with White Oak, why is White Oak uh, an important deal. Um, and then there's an assessment. Uh, there's also a spatial assessment, which comes later. It, it seems repetitive, uh, but it's not. That it's, a, it's a little bit of a different 
uh, aspect of, of you know what's going on with white oak so you can find out about that um, page 40 is the uh, that starts the upland oak the oak management practices that can make all this regenerate regeneration uh, happen in the forest you know that's not happening so uh, and then finally the conservation plan itself uh, wrapping up at the end So it starts out about the White Oak Initiative. Um, you know, what's going on with White Oak? Why, why was the initiative created? Um, you know, why did we need it? How, how, is it uh, how did it come together? You know, and who all is involved? And of course, you can go to whiteoakinitiative.org and uh, scroll down and, and you can read the thing just like I am right now. So it's available, and I suggest, you know, if you're interested at all, uh, take a dive in here and, and look around because it's, it's got some good things. This is the steering committee that uh, originally came together to sort of drive the White Oak Initiative forward and, and make sure it's a success. Um, you know, so a lot of entities here are involved uh, and interested in, to, to make sure that White Oak uh, forests remain healthy. So as part of the introduction, it's, uh, it provides a brief description of White Oak. Um, so you can learn all about White Oak, uh, what's happening in the forest, uh, you know, why is there a consequential shift that has to do with White Oak not regenerating the way it needs to, other oaks as well. Um, what are the challenges involved with, you know, this problem with regeneration and growing White Oak throughout the the uh, age of a forest. Um, and of course, you know, it, it involves forest management, but it's also a change in land use. You know, forests don't always remain forest, right? Um, so some different things are happening, whether it's private or public uh, lands, you have different challenges. Uh, you, you know, those are addressed here and, and, and some of the solutions, you know, that, that uh, can be used to fix that. White oak is, uh, wide ranging species. It encompasses basically the entire Eastern United States. Uh, this is a bar graph. If you've been on here and, and listened to some of my White Oak uh, talks before, you've seen this. So this is worth uh, looking at and, and studying a little bit. You know, this is, this is where our White Oak forests are. They're between 50 and 100 years of, of age. Uh, the younger oaks, uh, they just aren't near as abundant. So that's where the problem's at. Uh, and this little, you know, this little seedling here has basically three leaves on it. It has no figure. So it's, it's not growing fast at all. Uh, and that's a problem. So there's ways to develop this to becoming a vigorous advanced regeneration uh, tree so that it can continue into the forest canopy. The spatial assessment, um, was done in three phases. So here you can read about each phase and what was going on. Phase one was an ecological assessment. Um, you know, white oak is widespread um, and white oak forests are mature. You know, we know that. It's, that's, that sort of highlights the problem. Um, phase two was about mapping these forests uh, from an economic, social, and wildlife assessment point of view. So. You know, the others are, are interested in white oak as well uh, for different reasons, right? So this is phase two of the project. Phase three involves combining those two phases to create kind of an interesting thing. It, it gets fairly complex, but it's worth looking at and figuring out um, how they came up with this because it makes sense. So what they've done is, uh, Throughout the eastern United States, um, there, you know, there's there's a lot of changes in, in the land type where, where white oak forests grow. And there may be um, different advantages in different areas and different regions uh, to look at white oak management in different ways. So the probability of regeneration success of, of oaks is not the same everywhere, right? Um, so it changes as you move around the country. 
and the, and, and the white oak area. Um, so, you know, it's given a weight of 60%, you know, that, that matters. Um, that's a pretty heavy weight in the success of white oaks, as is, um, you know, having capacity of foresters to engage with landowners to help see this through. So each of these items here is assigned a different weight and those weights are put together to create kind of a final score. Uh, each state has different regions within the state. I'll scroll down here to Kentucky. And here's Kentucky, um, interior low plateau, Shawnee Hills. So that's the region that, that uh, starts in South Central Kentucky and kind of wraps around southward uh, to the east side of land between the lakes. Uh, Kentucky has two uh, regions actually that are over 40, which is pretty good. The next one is uh, Northern Cumberland Plateau. So remember that because they have also uh, used those regions as part of the spatial analysis to study each region within the White Oak Range. Every state does not have a region. Uh, Kentucky happens to. Um, so here you can uh, you can look at the Northern Cumberland Plateau and find out all about it. You know what makes it tick, how White Oaks doing there. Um, you know what are some of the challenges specifically with this region, and how can it be overcome? And of course, you know other regions as well, um, Lower Peninsula, uh, Ozarks. So that's to me it's interesting and it's worth getting in there and. Uh, you know, and looking at finding out what's going on. This is, uh, sorry for the scrolling, um, the family forest owner survey. So during this process, landowners, forest landowners were surveyed um, to find out, you know, what, what are your thoughts on forest management? Um, are you interested in ever having a timber harvest or, you know, would you rather not? Um, you know, what are your thoughts on using herbicide as part of forest management? So all this is, you know, it's pretty interesting and uh, it, it, it sort of opens things up, you know, about, uh, about the ownership of, of the forests and how they feel about doing oak management. So, you know, a lot of good, good information in here. This is, throughout this, you'll see uh, these little highlighted light green, yellow, uh, pages that are articles. In this particular case, this is an article about uh, uh, Clifton Taylor's tree farm. It's a nationally recognized tree farm uh, here in Kentucky, you know, and they do some great things. They've, they've got a history of doing good forest management and it shows. So looking forward, uh, you know, we have to figure out how to manage forests and make sure that uh, those tools are out there for everyone to have access to, right? Which brings us to the upland oak management techniques. So these are the, some of the management tools that can help solve the problem. For instance, this is a good little graph to, to open up and look at when you have time. On the right, each of these are practices that are listed that you can do in a forest. At the top here is the life cycle of forest. It starts out as a large saw timber forest. Something happens, it's harvested right here. Now it's regenerating. Then it grows to become sapling size, one to six inch diameter trees. Then those trees grow to become pole size trees and eventually small saw timber. Um, and underneath each of these phases of a forest, is highlighted in the darker where these practices can be applied. So you can't just apply any practice to any forest situation uh, and any age of forest. You know, they, they're specifically honed in for certain timing events uh, so that the forest can, you know, maintain healthy growth as it needs to. So that's interesting. It sort of helps us set the table and, and, and lay things out as far as management, what needs to happen. You know, the first thing that needs to happen is you need to get oak seedlings in the understory. You need to get them on the ground. Um, after that, you have to develop those into advanced regeneration, which is, uh, you know, those are trees that are three or four feet tall with a lot more leaves. You know, they're ready to be uh, let go and released. Um, 
You know, there's different harvesting methods that can incorporate um, regeneration and, and addressing that to make sure that uh, we move forward in a healthy way. Post-harvest uh, treatments are often necessary in order to, to give the advanced regeneration plenty of sunlight um, so that it can continue. So all these things come together um, to, help, to help us maintain these healthy oak forests. These are the same practices. They've been prioritized or grouped together as far as uh, the highest opportunity level. That doesn't mean the most important. This is kind of a best bang for your buck type of thing. Uh, Mid-story removal, crop tree release, uh, the shelter wood establishment cut uh, has embedded within it, you know, ways to make sure that we get regeneration there and we release the regeneration um, in the right way so that it does not get out competed by uh, other species that are less desirable. Um, so that's, you know, it's worth looking at. I think all this is interesting. The 2018 Farm Bill and how it relates to white oak management is important. That's where the funding comes, comes from to do all this on the ground work, uh, you know, through our, our NRCS offices and, and, and state foresters and consulting foresters can use this money for, to help landowners uh, get this work done and, and cut some of the costs. So the Farm Bill is definitely a big part of it. And of course, the, you know, the, the whole point of the initiative is to uh, bring people together. You know, it's collaboration. Um, you know, we, we know how to do this. We have to be able to um, look at site-specific problems and stand-specific problems uh, and, and learn how to solve them. And, uh, you know, that's what's going on here. So we have short-term goals for the White Oak Initiative, right? Um, you know, we want to make sure that foresters are trained, that landowners know about this, you know, that it's, uh, uh, that it's basically put in place for them, you know, to, to grow healthy forests and know what they have out there in their forests. But there are also long-term goals, which are 50 years into the future. Uh, we need to be able to assess the forest stand that we have, and hopefully it's in better shape. Hopefully it's, it has a better balance um, at that point. So definitely long-term goals are important. Um, that's built into the, to the, to the initiative to make sure that we um, are able to keep up with that and, and, and know that we're being successful as we go. This is the land ownership of uh, the range-wide white oak across the eastern United States. It's over 50% private family owned forest, as we would expect. And then also uh, private corporate makes up an additional 15%. The rest is a, is a mix of public and privately owned. You know, research, continued research is definitely important to make sure that we continue to move forward as we need to. Um, it's not just about harvesting timber and growing forest products. We also have to uh, deal with invasive species and other factors. And, uh, you know, if, if you've listened to From the Woods today um, before, you've seen a lot of this stuff here. And these are things that, you know, you just have to deal with when, whenever you do any kind of forest management. This is fairly, it's, it's, it's a complete document. It's good as a resource. Um, it's worth it to open this thing up and read through it, you know, skip through parts you, you, you're not so much interested in, but there's some good information in here. Well, thank you, Darren. We greatly appreciate that presentation. And I noticed you mentioned the farm bill. So is the next farm bill gonna be part of the White, or the White Oak Initiative, the next farm bill? So hopefully, right? That needs yeah. to happen. And, you know, if, 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 uh, if things, roll out the way I think they will. The next farm bill will probably be in 2023. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be nice to have White Oak Initiative, White Oak Forest, Upland Oak Forest as a line item, you know, it, that generates funding that, that gets all the tools really out there that, that you need in order to make this a success, um, you know, and that's important. Right. 
Yeah, no doubt, Darren. I mean, I know this White Oak Initiative is important to Kentucky, but as you've shown, it's really, really a more regional and really kind of central yeah. U.S. issue, central east U.S. So um, it's really exciting to see you all kind of progress to this point to where this is out there and it gives some guidance, to kind of support uh, everything that the um, initiative is trying to do. So, um, uh, yeah, it's an exciting moment. With it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I look forward to hearing more about it. And, you know, and we want to use this as a platform to help you all get the word out about the White Oak Initiative. Definitely. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Billy, we've covered a lot of ground yet again, everything <laughs> from bugs to trees to not funguses. Uh, yes. <laughs> right Thank you, issue. Megan. Yes. But yeah, a big thanks to Dr. Larson and Laurie and um, Darren for um, presenting with us today. Really appreciate that. It was good mm -hmm. stuff. So. Yes, it was. So, um, you know, every week we're on at 11 o'clock. So spread the word because we want to, uh, we don't want to do, we only do this for you all. So if you right. have any questions or comments, you can leave them at fromthewoodstoday.com along with every show that we've ever done is also yeah. on that website. Yeah. Hey, and I'll give a quick plug. If you're in the Northern Kentucky area this weekend, we've got a great program. The Ohio River Valley mm -hmm. Woodland Wildlife Workshop is going to take place Saturday. Um, so there's, you can still register for that. Um, yeah. Check us out ukforestry.org and you can register from there so come meet me i'll be checking everybody in yeah, there you go what a great will you be signing autographs no no uh, <laughs> i doubt anybody wants mine <laughs> no no again thank you all for being with us and uh, we'll look yeah. forward to seeing you all next week. all right take care see you next week right. bye from the woods today